Norman, one of the things that you talk about regarding journalism is the difference between somebody like a Thomas Friedman and somebody like an Ashley Bannonfield and what ends up happening when you tell the truth versus when you just become a, a, a habitual liar. Um, I've always regarded Thomas Friedman as one of the poster childs for the downfall of our First Amendment, uh, basically doing it all for the money and nothing more. And Ashley, who barely stepped out of line from what I could see, but even that slight deviation from what is considered the corporate narrative can basically get you, you know, thrown out of a job, in some cases run out of a career. What has been your experience and is there a particular inflection point where you think that there was this shift or has it really always been this way since the Vietnam War? I think the technology, of course, has changed. The styles have changed. The, the hairstyles have changed. How correspondents speak and dress and some of the um, boundaries that are understood stylistically and otherwise. But the underlying pattern has been uh, very similar. And we know the expression, and I think it's true, the first casualty of war is truth. And certainly in the last six or seven decades, we go back to the Vietnam War, this has been a pattern. Um, there's a great book by Michael Hare, who was an independent journalist covering the Vietnam War. He wrote a book called Dispatches. And he talked about how the briefings would be presented by the US military. Uh, they'd be lapped up by the US media lapdogs, essentially. That's my terminology. And he said, after a while, the rhetoric, the language, the jargon, just blows through your mind and you don't really deal with much less convey what war is all about. And that is death. And admittedly, any technology, any journalism is gonna fall short <clears throat> of really conveying what the death, the misery, the suffering, the anguish of war is all about. But because of the media bias, and as I talk about in the book, uh, the tinting of the window on the world, red, white, and blue, the anesthetizing effects, the incredibly deep and horrific biases having to do with nationality and racism and so forth. When the Russians kill people, that's a horror. When Americans uh, out of the Pentagon firepower kill people, well, that's unfortunate. And of course, we've seen this pattern really play out in terms of the Israeli military and all the excuses that have been used. So uh, sort of it's, it's a long uh, roundabout way of answering your question that, yes, I think this has been true for even centuries, but with the increase of the capacity of the most powerful military in the world to cause widespread decimation on literally many continents, then it ups the ante in terms of the death, the suffering, and the Orwellian dimensions of what's really being inflicted, not only far away, but close to home. You know, really that for the Pentagon, the propaganda systems, the media coverage and non-coverage are just as important as the missiles and the bombs and the bullets. Right, I, yeah, it all works together. They all work together to keep it going. And I was noticing, like, there's a couple of different layers here. So on the one hand, we downplay, obviously, who we are in the world, right? Like, we're the good guys. Everyone else is the bad guys. It's so clear how we use active voice, passive voice with whoever we think are the good guys or the, or the villains. And then where we also care or more or less based on who are the oppressed. So when it's white people in Ukraine, then we seem to be extremely concerned and you see everybody putting Ukrainian flags in their profile and everyone's like, oh my God, the Ukrainian people. Um, and yet we do not see that when it's darker people. Yes, as you say, there are the different layers. There, there, there's the racial aspect and there's a nationalistic aspect. And often, and this has played out in Ukraine, uh, in Gaza and elsewhere, Iraq and Afghanistan earlier in this century, the main portrayal when there is suffering from war and the United States policy is to inflict and perpetuate that suffering is what I call in the book, victims without victimizers. So we have seen that in terms of this absolute slaughter going on uh, with US weapons making it possible 
in Gaza. And in the US media coverage, the language selection, which I should mention, and also the implicit or sometimes explicit blame is very circumscribed. So yes, uh, the Israeli government gets some blame, but the people who are suffering and dying in Gaza, essentially in the US media, are portrayed as victims without victimizers. The victimizers include the US government at the very, very top level. I cite in the book a study that was done by the Intercept media outlet, and they looked at the first several weeks of the killing after October 7th, including October 7th, the horrible killing by Hamas, uh, what resulted because of the Hamas attack in 1,200 deaths. And then the subsequent many, many weeks, the first weeks of the death, the killing in Gaza. And the word slaughter was used by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and LA Times. The word slaughter was used 60 times to describe what was done to the Israelis by Hamas. In the same time period, the word slaughter was used only once to describe what was done by the Israeli military to people in Gaza. There was a similar ratio with the word massacre, 125 times to two times. So we're really in a, a, an Orwellian twilight zone where despite all the uh, professions, so to speak, and this goes to the previous question, of great journalistic integrity and so forth, we really have this uh, internalized value system or unvalue system where journalists really serve, consciously or not, as mouthpieces for a dehumanization of some people by the U.S. government. Right. Certainly, when I look at what goes on in terms of our State Department or, um, you know, Homeland Security or whoever those people are that are just spewing lies, I cannot stop wondering why we're even bothering to have those press conferences anymore with people like Mark Miller or whatever his name is. Why are we even bothering to ask these people questions? Because they're so blatantly lying and everybody in the room knows it and they just sit there and it's like... Yeah, the line comes in, in so many different forms, uh, the euphemisms, the evasions. Uh, I, I quote in the book, one of the spokespeople, I think it was Matt Miller at the State Department, when by law, the State Department needed to certify that the Israeli government was not using U.S. weapons in a way that violated human rights. And there's very clear definitions of what that means. And with a straight face, Miller tells the press earlier this year, um, well, Secretary uh, of State Blinken has certified that the Israeli government uh, has not been violating human rights with the U.S. supplied weapons. Well, it doesn't uh, pass uh, the crime test, so to speak. It's just uh, horrific. This is, uh, this is newspeak that is done, as they say, with a straight face, and it, um, it continues to plunge the uh, minimal standards of what is accepted as uh, cognitive reason in the U.S. news media. And it's really, you know, I have Stone, the great journalist, used to say that he couldn't understand why his colleagues prided themselves in saying that they were never surprised by anything. And I think, you know, if we're, if we're open to the world, we don't know what to expect. Uh, things can happen that might really, really astonish us. We certainly don't have a workable crystal ball. And I see that as sort of two levels because if we're not outraged, then we're not paying attention. At the same time, if we can extrapolate from history, this shouldn't really astonish us. You know, we should be taken aback by this um, newspeak, this double think that's being perpetrated by U.S. mass media and politics, and certainly by the bipartisan uh, uh, folks on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, we should be uh, horrified. And I think part of the challenge for us is to stay horrified because it's like a Novocaine from mass media, uh, trying to numb us, trying to normalize 
what is an ongoing genocide courtesy of U.S. taxpayers in Gaza. Norman, what do you attribute the disposition of the upper liberal class, particularly a um, friend of the show, Matt Orfalo, was at uh, Kamala's uh, rally at the Washington Monument the other day. And, you know, these are all people obviously from, you know, Chevy Chase and, you know, Fairfax and places like that. But, you know, the answers that they were giving were, I mean, one of them even said outright, oh, I, I, I want her to be president because she's going to continue the war in Ukraine. It's, it's like there really is something to be said for the constant finger pointing at MAGA being a cult. But I got to tell you, there really is something to be said for the upper class liberals just completely being in lockstep with whatever the Democratic establishment tells them. And they're taking these cues specifically from people who portray themselves as being journalists. That's why the overreaction, and that's something we definitely want to talk about, the insane overreaction to WAPO not endorsing Kamala and the way that it just completely messed with their worldview that they will, oh, I have to cancel my subscription. Like that is a really deep indoctrination that I don't think people truly understand. Fascinating is that there has been such a pushback and sort of the mask has fallen that billionaire owning a media outlet. And if you go back to the Graham family owning the Washington Post during the Vietnam War, they were very pro-war. And yet there's a pretense uh, that I work for a newspaper, I read a newspaper, the ownership doesn't matter. It does matter. And I think this is whatever one thinks of an endorsement or non-endorsement, it's a very clear example that the owners ultimately, they do call the shots. Uh, historically, uh, and I'm just old enough to have been a teenager uh, during the escalation of the Vietnam War, the Washington Post was very pro-war. And the the liberal elites that you're referring to of the day, they were also really for escalating the Vietnam War for many, many years until the criteria fell that, hey, we're, we're, we, quote unquote, we are not winning. If the Vietnam War uh, could have been concluded with a U.S. victory, they would have remained happy as clams about the escalation and the slaughter and so forth. I think that's fair to say. If we fast forward now to the autumn of 2024, there's a sharp distinction if you look at the foreign policy of the Republican and Democratic parties, they may differ in emphasis, but they are both unhinged militaristic parties. Uh, the Republican Party says, you know, well, don't be so enthusiastic about the Ukraine war, but uh, Trump and his folks, they want to go after China. So it's a different style of militarism, uh, but both the Democratic and Republican parties are totally locked into uh, what that leftist Dwight Eisenhower called a military industrial complex. When you get to domestic policy, I think we need to look at what's right in front of us. These are two very different parties and Harris and Trump are two very different candidates. And I think it's a challenge for us to acknowledge those differences that the foreign policy is a friggin' mess with both parties and domestically, it's extremely important as to who wins, unless we think that the Bill of Rights don't matter, unless we think that it doesn't matter whether a woman has a right to abortion, unless we think that shredding the social safety net doesn't matter. And the mass media are not able or willing to make those kind of distinctions because, for one thing, they're on board with the warfare state anyway. 